Hello, I'm Rachel, the Messy Minimalist. Welcome back to my channel. Today, we're gonna talk about the concept of death cleaning. Whether or not you know what that is, I will explain it to you and also talk to you a little bit about what I've learned as a survivor of somebody who didn't death clean. I don't know about you guys, but over the past couple weeks, this has been a concept that has just been coming up over and over. It's just a reoccurring phrase that keeps appearing in my social channels. And I thought that it was finally time for me to dig into it and see what this was all about. And I found that it's actually pretty interesting. Let me first explain what death cleaning is, just in case you guys don't know. The concept of death cleaning is actually Swedish. I should say it is Swedish death cleaning. And it comes from the Swedish words death and cleaning, also known to them as dostanding. Dostanding. Dust in the name. Anyway, <laughs> the phrase death cleaning really started to become mainstream because a Swedish author named Margareta Mengesson, if I'm saying it right, published a book. And her book was all about this idea of death cleaning. And the way that she would talk about it would be that death cleaning is something that starts later in life. The whole idea of death cleaning is that you clean up and you go through your items, you declutter, you choose what means something to you, what doesn't mean anything and is worth just getting rid of, what you want to pass on to somebody, and you go through all that stuff so that way when you do finally pass away, your loved ones then aren't burdened with having to make those decisions and ask those questions and figure out what to keep, what not to keep, what to do with the stuff. It kind of sounds a lot like minimalism. In some ways, it's even a little bit like the KonMari method, and it's a lot like what everybody calls just straight up decluttering. I was a little skeptical at first, and I thought, well, this is just somebody else trying to capitalize on this wonderful trend of minimalism and finding a new way to talk about it. Potato, potato. Tomato, tomato. Potato, potato. Anyway, it doesn't matter, that's the point. I think there is a place for finding different ways to consider minimalism because it's not all the same. It is all very different for everybody and that's why it works for so many people. Everyone's on a different journey. Our paths are different, the way we think is different, the way we're gonna process our own stuff is different. So why not view a new way to motivate yourself, such as death cleaning, as a way to talk about minimalism? It's kind of like Fifty Shades of Minimalism. There's a different degree that we all take when it comes to Trying to minimize. Sometimes it gets weird, you know, sometimes it gets morbid in this case with death cleaning. But at the heart of it, it's still us trying to find ways to have less things, to be happier with what we have, and ultimately to free up our lives. It's just kind of an interesting way to look at it, and I think it's okay for us to differentiate the different, you know, methods and approaches to minimalism. The idea of death cleaning is really in some ways a selfless act. Frankly, minimalism in a lot of ways is kind of a selfish act, but not in a bad way. It's just the motivations are different. Death cleaning is for the future of your loved ones and minimalism and decluttering as we know it is for the future of ourselves typically. This is an interesting topic to me because I'm a survivor of somebody who didn't practice minimalism, who didn't ever declutter, and who definitely didn't death clean. It kind of unearthed some feelings that I'd been having for a long time. I didn't realize it till very recently that it's been almost four years since I lost somebody very dear to me. It made me kind of come back and look at some of the stuff that I had sort of buried deep down and didn't want to deal with. That's when I decided to deal with those things. I hope that me talking about these things that I've learned can help some of you guys who might be going through a grieving process as well. Perhaps you also had a loved one who passed away who didn't death clean, or maybe you have somebody who is getting up there in age who does hold on to a lot of stuff and you're just trying to figure out how to broach the subject. So, the five things that I learned as a survivor of somebody who did not death clean. The first one's kind of an easy one, but it's so true. If you had a loved one who passed away, who had a lot of stuff and didn't talk to you about it, just know it's going to be painful. So if you can accept that and move forward, that is a huge first step, just knowing that it's gonna hurt and that's okay because grieving hurts. The second one is to trust your gut. Like that is some of the best advice that pretty much can go for all walks of life. And in this case, if your loved one had a lot of stuff, you are gonna have a lot of questions when you're going through those items and you probably won't know what they loved and didn't love or what they really loved and only kind of loved. You're gonna wonder and question. You're gonna wrestle with yourself to figure out if you're making the right decisions. Then you're gonna second guess yourself and then you're gonna hold on to more than you need. If you're thinking of keeping something just because you think that your loved one might have really loved it, but you're not sure, 
it's okay to let it go. Oftentimes we err on the side of thinking that it was more important than it was. And in the beginning, it's gonna feel like everything meant everything to them because for somebody who holds on to a lot of stuff, oftentimes even to them, they think it means something. But you're gonna know deep down because you've either seen that person wearing it all the time, looking at it all the time, referencing it. You'll just know. And so I say trust your gut. The third thing that I learned is that it is okay to not want to keep something even if your loved one really loved it. It's okay to let something go even if it's a valuable item. I say this because you are going to be the one to live with this item for the rest of your life. So just because they really, really loved it or just because it was really valuable, it doesn't mean it has to be an important thing in your life. It doesn't mean it has to be anything in your life. You're probably watching this because you're interested in decluttering and minimalism and having less things and being less controlled by your stuff. So when you go through somebody's things and stuff that they had that was just in excess, it's difficult because we need to separate our own lives and say, hey, you know what? I still have plans for my life going forward. Just because they were controlled by a lot of stuff doesn't mean you have to be too. It is okay to let it go. Only keep what really means something to you because it's your memories that you're gonna have to have every time you walk by that item. If it's not a good memory, if it's a memory out of guilt that you know you just kept it because, oh, she really loved that, that's not a good feeling. Nobody should live with guilt in their heart. They should live with feelings of freedom, lightness, and love. Definitely don't keep an item just because they loved it. You have to have meaning in it too. The fourth thing that I learned by surviving somebody who did not death clean. You can't hide the items. You just can't. You have to deal with the stuff. Tucking away items and not dealing with it only prolongs your ability to deal with the grief. And I know this firsthand because there are a lot of things that I tucked away and just tried to forget about. Four years later, I'm encountering these items. I realized only now that this whole time they were kind of nagging me. You should make a priority, if you can, to work through this stuff, to get through the things. I say this knowing that the grieving process is different for everyone. I can only imagine what other people are feeling and it's tough and I know that. I believe, at least from my experience, that we should make a priority of trying to get through this stuff as soon as we can. And I say this having gone almost four years and still not getting through all the stuff, but if we could say try to get through it in the first year or try to get through it in the first two years, that's gonna really help with us in, in healing. The longer that the stuff sits around, the more difficult it is to determine what role it really played in their life. It all just becomes stuff. Dealing with it early as opposed to prolonging that process is gonna help us heal. The last thing that I learned that I wanted to share, and this might be the most important thing, is that it is never too late to talk to a loved one who's getting older about death cleaning. You don't necessarily have to call it death cleaning. That might be a little bit scary. Talking about the concept of going through your items, talking about what's important to them, talking about their wishes, that's not an easy conversation. And maybe some cultures it's easier than others, but for whatever reason, in American culture, death just isn't something that people really wanna talk about. Maybe that's Midwestern culture, I'm not really sure, but it's not an easy conversation. It's the conversation that now, in retrospect, I really wish that I'd had with my mom before she passed. It wasn't just about stuff. It's not always just about the stuff. Sometimes it's about so much more than that. Whether it's about stuff, whether it's about pain management, if they lose their mind or not, you know, where they wanna be, who they want to take care of them. There's so many questions. And I think opening up the conversation while your loved one is alive and doing well is the most important thing that you can do. The most important thing. Those are the five things that I learned as a survivor of somebody who did not death clean. If for some reason I can do anything to encourage other people out there to have those conversations with their loved ones so they don't have to go through the questions and the wondering that I did or that maybe you are going through yourself, I think that's a good thing. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching. This was actually a strangely hard one for me to talk about and I think maybe it's the whole thing of 
death being a tough topic to talk about in general, it's like I have stumbled through my words this entire video. So I'm hoping it comes together. I'm hoping you can't tell that I had any trouble at all. Let me know in the comments what you guys think about this whole thing of death cleaning, if you think it's just another word for minimalism, if you think it's something totally different, if you've experienced being a survivor of somebody who either did or didn't death clean, I'd really love to know. Leave something in the comments and we can go ahead and talk about that. And otherwise, I hope you'll check out my blog post on messyminimalist.com where you can see a little bit more of my deeper thoughts on that. And that's it. Thanks again and I will talk to you all later. Shake it out, shake it out, okay. Why can't I segue from that? It's almost like you say the word death and it's just like, well, that's it. <laughs> There's something else to say. <sighs> okay. Spit it out. Bleh. Magdala. No, wait. Magdala. I'm just not even going to be able to say her name. That's just what it's going to come down to. I literally can't say her name. It's just not in my head. Margareta Mangasan. I'm terrible with names and I'm terrible with accents. You guys heard me try to say Huga. I just finally now, after like six months, can say Huga. 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 To get back to my point, what was my point? This is gonna be a tough edit. Okay.